Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, midweek webinar on the 16th of March. Uh, believe it or not, this is our 26th uh, webinar that, that we had, or webinar or presentation that we've had. Yeah, our first one we started on the 14th of July. Anyway, let's go onto the, uh, onto the screen. Right, so this is our usual uh, NICD uh, dashboard. Not an awful lot to discuss. It's pretty similar to what we've seen over the past several weeks. So it's looking reasonably good. We're averaging on a weekly basis about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 new, new cases um, and a few deaths. So it's kind of grumbling along. We see this in the epidemic curve as well. Uh, here's our, our fourth curve, our Omicron-driven uh, driven curve. And you see the epidemic curve is, is trying to edge, as I mentioned on a number of occasions before, uh, towards the interwave baseline level, not quite reaching it there. This is a little bit out of date, but uh, we, we are more or less over here as well. So certainly we are out of the fourth wave. There's no question by definition we're out of the fourth wave. Um, but um, there's a kind of a low-grade grumbling uh, infection, which is, which is carrying on. Uh, we're looking at the percentage positivity of tests, which go to the laboratory. Sorry, this is a little bit old. This is now dropped to just at 5% now, which is really a kind of level we wanted to reach uh, in the interwave uh, period. So all of this is looking pretty good. The Hatsula monitoring program also looking good. Uh, the graph is coming down now. 49 new cases over the last week and still 63 active cases. But you can see it certainly is coming down now. So yeah, we are in a pretty good space at the moment. Um, and I, I've got these two, these are two interesting publications which have uh, very recently uh, come out. Uh, one of them from Cheryl Cohn and her colleagues at the NICD, um, where they did an interesting study actually. They, they looked at households in a rural setting and households in an urban setting. The rural setting was in a place called Agent Court in Pumalanga, and the urban was in, in Clarkstorp in Northwest Province. And they look at uh, something like just over 200 uh, households, that's about 1,200 people, and they followed them longitudinally over a period of a year to try and assess how many people do get infected, how many people get reinfected, uh, how many people have been vaccinated. And importantly, what I wanted to mainly stress uh, is the level of uh, infection, uh, because we do know, and I said on a couple of occasions, let me get out the way, a couple of occasions uh, that we've got a very high level of immunity in the population. Um, now, this, of course, is a fairly youngish population. Uh, so the great majority, 85% of, of this population had no symptoms, or asymptomatic, and they were carefully followed up longitudinally. They had, throats, they had um, swabs taken twice a week, they had blood taken every two months, so very, very carefully monitored. And over 60% over this year period were infected. So you can see that there's the silent transmission in the younger population, something which we've, uh, we've known, but it's great having this in this very good study, um, kind of confirming it and supporting it. 85% uh, asymptomatic to silently spread the infection and then getting it to over 60% of the population. Uh, another important article from Shubia Mardi and his group, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, also came out very recently, um, where they also looked at antibodies uh, in various populations in Gauteng province. And again, look at the unvaccinated population, and you can see even unvaccinated, there's quite a high level of antibodies. In other words, that they've been exposed to this silent circulating um, mainly Omicron Omicron variant, because this was done pretty recently, uh, from 55.8 to the children, all the way to 71%. Um, and the vaccinated, of course, very, very much higher. And pr probably looking at both these together, uh, from 70 to 80% of our population have got antibodies. And this probably is a major reason why the epidemic has been reasonably mild, uh, the Omicron. Of course, as I have mentioned in the previous, um, previous session, uh, the virus itself also is intrinsically mild, uh, and this has been shown in animal studies, 
Uh, it's been shown in, in, in uh, laboratory studies on cell culture, um, where this, this Omicron virus doesn't tend to infect the lower respiratory tract, the lungs, mainly it affects the upper respiratory tract. So it's a combination. We're immune, and also the virus seems to be relatively mild. So in this kind of background, in this milieu, of course, many people are asking, is the COVID-19 pandemic over? And we saw, uh, as, as you, I'm sure you've all seen in the media, uh, the government has now extended the Disaster Management Act for another month. And this has been very sharply criticized from many, many quarters. Um, I won't go into that debate, um, but basically what I did want to bring out is that I think that a lot of people, not the scientific, and uh, irrespective of what gets reported in the media, none of my scientific colleagues feel that we can dispense with masks totally, we don't need to be vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, a lot of the non-scientific population feel that maybe we're at the end of the pandemic, the Omicron was kind of the gateway indicator that coming to the end of the pandemic, now we don't have to worry anymore, no more masks, no more enthusiasm to get vaccinated and so on. Um, and in that context, uh, I think I mentioned it last, uh, last week, uh, I'm going to probably take a break now. We won't have another session now for next Wednesday or for quite a few weeks. We'll be traveling, in fact, for the next couple of weeks. Um, but we'll see how we go with the epidemic, uh, maybe after Pesach, after towards the end of April, uh, we can uh, come together again. We'll certainly let you know uh, when these uh, updates uh, will carry on. But at the moment, it's pretty quiet. Uh, and it's really kind of repeating the same kind of epidemiological information week in and week out. All right, is the epidemic over? Well, we need to ask three questions. Will there be a fifth wave? Okay. If there's a fifth wave, when will it arrive? When, will, when can we expect it? And what will it look like? Now, will there be a fifth wave is probably the easiest one to answer. And we can say probably, if not in all certainty. There's a fan chance we won't have a fifth wave because of the immunity buildup. Uh, but I think the probability is that we will have a fifth wave. Second one, also reasonably uh, easy to answer. And I'll come to that just now. And what would it look like? The most difficult one to answer. So coming back to our epidemic curves, um, you can see that there's a relatively consistent periodicity of these curves. Every about three months or so, we have a new variant, and the new variant causes an upswing of the epidemic uh, at intervals of about three months. Uh, there was a little bit of an artifact here. This was, of course, shorter than three months, and that is probably a result of a backlog in reporting. Um, this was uh, towards the end of July, August, September, when there were the unrests in KZN and Gauteng. Many of the clinics were closed down, and that caused a backlog. So this is probably artificial. This curve probably would have come down like that. So this interval between the waves uh, of about three months. So if that does repeat, and it probably will repeat when we do have a fifth wave, we can expect the fifth wave probably the end of April and into May. Um, the reason why we do have this periodicity, because you must remember that this was the ancestral strain, the original one. Then we had the beta strain, which was a fitter virus displacing this one. Then we had the delta strain, fitter than the beta, displacing it, and then the Omicron fitter in, in turn to the, to the delta. Fitter, we meaning, in other words, being more transmissible, being more infectious, and also escaping from the immune system. So what will it, what will it look like? And this is, this, this is difficult, or we can speculate, and let's try and speculate this through. Uh, we have seen a uh, variation of Omicron, I think I've dealt with that, to form subvariants. The original Omicron was BA.1. Uh, that has mutated now to a more infectious, more transmissible BA.2, but fortunately not more immune escape. In other words, if you've been infected with BA.1, you probably are going to be protected against BA.2. These other two subvariants have not really taken off. BA.2 has now become the dominant a subvariant in South Africa and probably worldwide as well. But these BA.2, BA.1, BA these are fairly mild uh, subvariants and far a mild um, uh, variant. 
So it's unlikely, very unlikely, that this ongoing mutation of Omicron to form these subvariants is going to either kick up the epidemic curve or be responsible for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the fifth wave. We really need to look at a new uh, variant, a brand new variant. And we can see our previous ones, the alpha, the beta, the delta in South America, the gamma, and the Omicron have been completely new variants coming off. They're not, in other words, they're not, they're not offshoots of these uh, other variants. Uh, the uh, Omicron came uh, on, on all of these, came from, uh, from um, uh, they uh, arose independently of each other, and they're not mutations of other variants. So the feeling is, uh, probably from the scientific information that we do know, is that the fifth wave will be due to a new variant, a completely new variant, as Omicron was, as Alpha was, Gamma was, Beta was, and Delta was. Now, that new variant, which does arise in the fifth wave, it's going to have to be a pretty super variant. Uh, as I mentioned just now, each of these variants has been fitter than its preceding variant, and because of that has been able to displace it. The one thing I do want to point out where there's a lot of people make a mistake. The fitter doesn't mean that it's going to be less virulent, that's going to cause less severe disease. We can't be certain about that. Um, the, uh, the beta certainly uh, was a fitter virus than the ancestral Wuhan, but was more caused more severe disease. As did the delta, the delta did cause quite a lot of severe illness, hospitalization. Unfortunately, now the Omicron went against that. That caused a milder disease. So unfortunately, we really don't have the tools to predict what the new variant is going to be. What we can say, though, is it's going to have to be a fitter virus. It's going to have to be more transmissible, and it's going to be, have to escape the immunity in the population uh, in order to establish itself. I'll, I'll, uh, there is one, perhaps, caveat to that. I'll bring it out just now. So where is the new variant going to come from? Is it going to come from the ability of the virus to multiply, to replicate? And as it multiplies in the human population, it then picks up these uh, mutations. These mutations then become lineages. And these lineages, if they are fit, they then become variants. So a large chunk of the population of the world, particularly on the African continent, the lighter shade means less and less vaccination. In some countries, in fact, um, vaccination levels are about five to seven to eight percent, pitifully low. So the virus is then multiplying unhindered in these population and then has the ability to pick up these mutations and become variants. Some countries in Asia as well, but mainly on the African countries. So it's under vaccination. And in fact, even in South Africa, we still, and I won't bore you again with all those vaccination slides, but just a summary, 48% of the adult, the whole adult population, not just the elderly, but the whole adult population over the age of 18 years of age um, have seen either one or two uh, vaccine doses. Only 43% have been fully vaccinated with a primary. In other words, the two doses of Pfizer or the one dose of Johnson & Johnson. So in other words, we're saying that 57% of our population are not adequately protected by vaccine and have to rely, as I showed you in the early slide, on the natural immunity to be protected. But nevertheless, it does give a pretty wide gap, which allows the virus to replicate, pick up these mutations, and then generate these variants. Uh, and I, I, I make no apology for showing this, these slides over and over again. Uh, this is it's updated. This is very topical. It's from yesterday's data. And you can still see that. I'll go, I'll, I'll skip this one. I'll go on to this one. That uh, the older sections of our population, those 60 plus, uh, only 62% have been fully vaccinated. 38% have not been fully vaccinated of this vulnerable age group. So hopefully a lot of them are protected by their natural immunity, but we have to assume that there would be still significant numbers of individuals who are still not protected, either from natural immunity or from the vaccine immunity. Another source of where variants will come from 
uh, are individuals whose immune systems uh, are not up to par. They have partially immunosuppressed or immunocompromised. For example, people with uh, infections such as HIV or people on cancer chemotherapy or other advanced diseases where the immune system is suppressed, that when they get infected, there's a, they, they can't clear the virus. So a remnant of virus remains behind multiplying in these individuals. And this has been shown, in fact, that um, they don't, these are the days after infection, up to 190 days, unable to clear the virus because of an adequate immune system, and therefore they pick up these mutations, and this is how variants can get, um, can get generated, as in the case of under-vaccinated individuals. And there have been a number of similar studies in uh, advanced HIV and chronic infection, uh, people on cancer chemotherapy and so on. They're a potential source of these variants. Another problem which has arisen is that uh, is what we call reverse zoonoses. We know that the original SARS-CoV virus two came from the animal kingdom, but what has been shown that the human SARS-CoV-2 can infect various animals and it can multiply in these animals and it can generate variants or can generate lineage, generate mutations in these animals. And that was shown early on, in fact, uh, early in the epidemic in the late, 19, uh, late 2020s in the mink farms in Denmark and Netherlands and other European countries, where they showed that the minks were being infected with human virus and were, the virus was mutating in these minks. And there was some uh, uh, evidence of infection to the mink handlers. So they had to cull the entire mink farm industry uh, in Denmark, uh, to some extent in the Netherlands. Millions of minks had to be um, uh, euthanized uh, and then incinerated. More recently, uh, a similar thing has been shown in wild animals. This is the white-tailed deer in North America, also shown to be infected with human SARS-CoV-2, human coronavirus, and also mutating. And there have been one or two, again, instances of infection being transmitted from white-tailed deers to hunters. Similar thing with domesticated animals as hamsters in Hong Kong, and again, a similar kind of story. So yeah, we have another possibility where variants can come from. And in fact, it has been shown, I spoke a few times about wastewater surveillance. Wastewater, in other words, sewage, we know the virus is excreted in stool. So monitoring wastewater is a very good indicator of the circulation of the virus in the population. This is a study that comes from New York City, where they've shown a number of lineages, cryptic, in other words, not shown in human specimens, but shown in the wastewater. So no, well, I mean, obviously, originally they came from human specimens, but not directly from humans. So in other words, indicating that this virus is generating um, these unusual lineages, uh, whether they'll become variants or not, uh, time will tell. There's another concern, and this is the caveat that I wanted to bring, that we do have widespread immunity now, that widespread immunity has attenuated the epidemic, and so we're very fortunate about that. The immunity both from infection and from vaccines. But the one thing we do know is that the immunity doesn't last forever. It starts waning, as you can see, from 75, 100 days. We usually say from about six months, and uh, that's where the original uh, interval for the for the booster dose came in. We now reduce it to three months um, because that th that booster now really has become essential to kind of pick up this immunity. But from natural immunity, we don't really know how long it's going to last. Um, or vaccine immunity also. This is another thing which also makes us a little bit vulnerable to the fifth wave. So we spoke about the. Um, evolution uh, pathways of Omicron, unlikely to cause a fifth wave, new variant, likely to cause a new wave. And then, of course, we still got the improbable at this stage, but the really worrying situation, can we have a new coronavirus? And it was not a variant of SARS-CoV-2, but a completely new sars cov introduced from the animal kingdom uh, into humans. Uh, this is the, the old slide. Uh, this is the horseshoe bat, which is supposed to be the main reservoir of, of SARS-CoV viruses. The original SARS-CoV-1 
causing uh, severe acute respiratory disease um, in the Far East uh, in 2003, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012, and now 2019 SARS-CoV-2. So will there be another one? Because we have had the history of these coronaviruses coming to the human population as humans get exposed to uh, exotic animal species from the legal wild animal trade, uh, the wet markets, etc., And uh, particularly in the Far East, and all these species are now circulating in bats and similar animals and could jump that species, that species barrier and enter into humans. So is the pandemic over? We can't, I, I, we'd like to think so. I would like to think so. You would like to think so. We'd all like to think so. I think the scientific information is against it. Uh, as I think of hope, I've kind of uh, given in the last 20 minutes why, why we think that it, it's not over. Um, there probably will be a fifth wave. Hopefully, the variant that will cause the fifth wave won't be a severe one, but we can't be absolutely sure. We can be optimistic and say, uh, I don't think we can be totally optimistic and say that's the end of the, of the, of the pandemic. I don't think, I think that's being too optimistic. We can be optimistic and say that the fifth wave will be a, a mild. In either event, the pandemic is not over. We still do need to retain uh, precautions. We do need to retain wearing masks, particularly in closed environments. We do need to be vaccinated. Vaccines are extremely effective, particularly in preventing severe disease. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Those who stuck out the last 26 episodes, uh, thank you to, to Adam, who's been the, uh, the backroom person. Uh, for, um, uh, and also thank you very much to the South African Jewish Board of Deputies for, uh, for sponsoring these, uh, these videos. I hope they've been of use. I hope they've been uh, valuable. I hope it's given you a background to what the uh, epidemic is all about. Uh, unfortunately, the media itself sometimes tends to be a bit uh, inaccurate, uh, but so, some of the media is very good, some is not quite so good. Uh, so you need to be, be a little, have a bit of circumspection uh, when reading these stories. So we'll take a bit of a break now uh, while, it is, while the epidemic is at a pretty low level, and we'll just play it by ear. Um, hopefully there won't be a need to carry on, but if there is, then we'll carry on uh, if and when uh, circumstances justified. So thank you very much. Keep well. Uh, let me say, as well. All the best. Keep well. Bye bye.